<laughs> Did you find us okay? Oh yeah, yeah. this must be the place to be with everything going around this building. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of Is that seat too low for you? Actually, it's a little too high. <laughs> too high. I'm short-legged, but I'll work it out. Okay. I'm okay. Right. okay. Well, on behalf of the Half School Board, I'd like to welcome Dr. James Burns uh, to our district. Thank and you. Dr. Burns is currently the superintendent of the River Valley School District in Three Oaks. Three Oaks, yeah, I saw that you had Buchanan down. That's where I live, but Three Oaks is my Three school Oaks district. Maybe. Yes. I'd like to take a minute just to describe our format. Uh, the interview will take approximately 90 minutes, and the candidate at the end will have an opportunity uh, to make a closing statement and ask the board any questions that are on their mind. The interview is being taped by Channel 25 and will be aired this weekend, and Brian will have a schedule up on uh, the TV later. Uh, because of the limited time, questions will not be taken from the audience. However, we do seek your input in this, from the staff and the community in the process. We have a candidate evaluation form uh, that's available on, on the side table. And if you want, we also have an assessment form that is available on the Hazlitt's webpage at hazlitt.k12.michigan.us. Uh, if you go to click on the superintendent search, then click on the candidate feedback form, uh, that form will come directly to Cheryl. And if you do fill out a form, please turn it in to the board secretary. Um, the board has, I just want to remind those that are our guests and the, the people that will, uh, might watch this on TV that uh, it is the board's legal responsibility to select the next superintendent. Uh, we do not want you to make a recommendation on who to hire. Rather, we want you to provide input as to their strengths and the concerns you may have with a candidate. The characteristics we are looking for are on the form, and you should use that as a guide. Finally, your form must be signed and, or your name printed on, this, uh, on it to be accepted by the board, and your comments are part of the public record. Any questions on the procedures? I get to begin. I'm going to start my question with Dr. Burns. Uh, while the board has had the opportunity to review Dr. Burns's resume, our audience has not. We'd like you to take uh, briefly to review your educational background and your, your employment history. Okay, sounds good. Um, I'm originally from Ypsilanti, Michigan, Detroit area, then Ypsilanti, Ann Arbor. I came to MSU, so I still bleed green and white all the way. Uh, for my bachelor's degree in home economics education or life skills, and I have a minor in marketing education. I went on to Central, received my master's degree in administration with a cognate in elementary ed. Went on for a specialist at Central Michigan University with a specialist in ed administration focusing on curriculum and instruction. And then I came back to MSU to get my doctorate degree in adult and continuing in ed, focusing on human resources and um, career and technical education, training and development. Um, I've been a teacher at the preschool, elementary, high school level both vocational and general ed. I've also been a teacher at the community college in foods and hospitality at Washtenaw Community College and a teacher at the university level teaching for Saginaw Valley and Western in the areas of ed leadership, early childhood, and curriculum instruction. Um, I have been a elementary principal. I have been a director of instruction at the central office level along with the uh, director of state and federal <coughs> programs, assistant superintendent, I've also served as an assistant to the um, assistant superintendent at the Intermediate School District up in Sharam near Petoskey. Let's see what else I've done. I'm thinking um, I have been a state supervisor from the Department of Education, so I'm very familiar with your school district in Lansing area. Um, I was state supervisor for home economics, focusing on foods and hospitality as well as child care services. And I oversaw the uh, consumer home economics area specifically parenting education. I also served as an assistant exec director for the Michigan Council on Voc Ed, and that was a liaison between the State Department and the State Board of Education, as well as the legislator. So different experiences along the way. Um, currently, I'm superintendent at River Valley Schools in Three Oaks, our last district, second to last district, Lake Michigan near Chicago. So that's who I am in my background. Dr. Burns, I get to ask the second question. Okay. Has it prides itself in being a progressive district. Uh, tell us about how you have worked with others to develop new or creative ideas to advance learning opportunities for kids and children. 
that's what's brought me to Hazlitt because I've watched Hazlitt for many, many years. Um, live and work in East Lansing, Lansing area. I actually substitute you for, for you back when I first started teaching. Um, looked at what you're doing now. Currently, I read your minutes from the last year, so I know what you've been up to. Um, really impressed with your early childhood center. That's, that's my passion for those little ones to get them ready for school. Some of the things I've been involved with is I'm really into developing folks in terms of professional development. I'm a true believer in professional development. I'm, I'm really into looking at programs for all kids, both the at-risk student as well as the gifted and talented student. Um, some of the things that, that I've done in my district is put in some contract language to be able to promote some of those kinds of things. Um, we really worked on diversity in terms of the, some of the school districts I worked with, and we've had some state and national awards for some of those efforts that we've worked with in our staff. So I pride myself in coming into a district, looking where you're at, and seeing how far you want to go, and making it happen through people. Thank you. Um, can you give us some examples in which you had several things that needed to be done at the same time and were of equal importance, and, and how did you handle that? Well, when I came into my school district now, one of the things that brought me to my school district is they needed a lot of work on accountability and efficiency in their, in their operations. Very little progress done there, as well as looking at our whole management team and possibly replacing some staff. So a lot of issues all at once. It was a small district at the time. And so going into that, just listening a lot. Um, I did a lot of um, focus groups with folks, talking about their strengths, their limitations, some of the strategies in terms of um, demographics of the area, and then worked with a group of people to prioritize what we're going to work on. So we had a, a long-term, well, short and long-term strategic plan. And then I also worked with our Board of Education to support me in my efforts. Um, some of those decisions are very hard decisions, but I think we made it through that for the best or the district and the kids. That's one example. Um, when I went into Saginaw Township as an assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction, um, that was a very large district next to a university just like you folks here. Um, and they had no curriculum development at all, absolutely no written curriculum. Pride themselves on a lot of kids going on to college, but no written curriculum, no accountability for that curriculum. A lot of kids didn't even take meat tests at that point in time. So getting folks working with teachers on their best practices and getting curriculum, curriculum working down, or, put together so they owned it. Developing that professional development actually rose our MEEP scores and we had a nice cooperation with the university. Just a couple examples of what we had to do. Dr. Burns, uh, could you give us some examples of how your work experiences qualify you for this position? I think I've had such a variety of experiences in my background which is helpful because I'm not the traditional candidate. Um, I started at MSU in the hotel restaurant management area, spent four years in my last year, worked with uh, student recruitment and as a resident assistant and orientation, and I found myself wanting to teach, so I went and changed my major at the last minute. My parents were very happy when I did that, but I think the experience of being in hospitality, working with lots of different people in restaurants, hotels, travel business, um, had, me ex had lots of experience working with people. Um, then going on to have the experience working at the state level gave me the opportunity to work with lots of school districts, a lot of community colleges, universities, as well as uh, small businesses and the linkages there with the legislature. So the political piece was, was there and I had the experience of actually working with legislatures on a daily basis, looking at a lot of data, developing position papers, doing public hearings, those kinds of folks. Um, that I also had the opportunity to travel to lots of school districts and work with lots of teachers to, in classrooms doing program evaluations. So that gave me a lot of experience and just on the cutting edge of that experience of Public Act 25 with school improvement and coming back to a local district and actually helping districts write their first annual education reports that you're familiar with. So that was also helpful. Having the experience of working in central office, we had a deficit probably about uh, 10 years ago and we had to cut about a million dollars uh, from our budget. And I took on the job of director of instruction in a very large district, larger than this one, and took on the principalship so I can be able to walk the talk of building principles. So that helped me do that. Um, I think I look for the challenges. I like just to learn new things all the time. Going back to school, I still have a passion for teaching, so I love to teach for the university just so I can be better at what I do every day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Dr. Burns, you mentioned budget. I guess it's <laughs> Probably been too long before you, you knew you were going to get a question on budget here. Um, <laughs> this is the budget season that we're in right now, um, developing a budget. If you would, in developing a budget, uh, what major goals and objectives do you 
as a superintendent do you establish? One of the things that we talk about is student achievement, and we go back to what our mission statement is and what we want for our kids. That's one of the things that we look at. And we look at ways, are we meeting the needs of the kids? And I think that's what we start with. And we look at programs that are making the difference, that show us the data that, that the kids are making a difference. And if we, we start from there, and we also look at staffing numbers of kids. If we want, early, if we want uh, small classrooms at the early L level, for example, do we still want our preschool program? What is the quality education? Is it K-12? Is it pre-K to adults? What is that? Uh, looking at our resources coming in, and then deciding what do we need to keep and what, do we, what can we do a, better at, be a, do a better job. So my plea to my staff that we work with together says if it's important, we need to find a way to keep it happening. Whether it's inside with revenue coming in or looking at resources not only in our school buildings but through our communities, looking at grants <coughs> after some of the goals that we're working on to make it happen and make it to budget for that. And it's been a tough one mm -hmm. because we had to look at what's important. And we're getting down, as you probably are too, is what's important in that bare bones now of how do we do a better job looking at other possibilities of still getting at our end result for what we're most proud of in our school district. And it's Thank gotten you. tougher. This is probably the worst <laughs> year as we speak. Thank you. Yeah. What is your philosophy and experience with the collective bargaining process? I have lots of experience in that area. Um, been on the side of being a teacher as a union leader when I was a teacher, as well as negotiations on management side. Um, also, in my school district, I wear all the hats. I don't have central office staff. You're looking at her. Um, I just have a lot of good people that I hire to do the job and let them do their job. So um, we have. I've had some principals step up to the plate who want to be possibly superintendents and given the experience of doing contract negotiations. So I have been sort of the support person for them, writing the language and those kinds of things. In our district, it's still very traditional on our corner of the earth over there. Um, but I'd rather see something like I've worked with in Lake Orion, which is Oakland County, Saginaw Township, where we do collaborative bargaining. And we do it all year long through what's called contract maintenance committee. So issues that come up, we try to problem solve <coughs> first. We try to come up with language so we can go in the contract. And it's very open in terms of um, <coughs> issues that we have or budgetary types of things. We're very open. We keep that dialogue open. So. Both sides of the fence. Both sides of the fence, exactly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Grant, as superintendent, what do you see as your role in promoting student achievement? What efforts have you made to ensure this is a reality in your school district? We pride ourselves on student achievement. When, when we we're a small district, and we were one, one of the school districts that were able to have two Golden Apple Awards that first year. We only had two elementary schools of K-5 for our size school district. We took two of the 10 slots in the state of Michigan for our size. Very proud of that. Um, we look at ways to recognize our kids. We look at ways to recognize our staff. We spend a lot of time on curriculum. We look at written curriculum. We, are, uh, we spend a lot of time looking at our data on test scores, the ways we test kids. And then what we do is we also have ways that we monitor that in terms of what teachers have developed. We spend a lot of time in, during professional development days just talking to each other about wor what works and what doesn't work. And we celebrate when we do well. And we have done really well. Same thing in our other districts. Um, student achievement is important to us. And not only we tell our kids, we tell our staff, we tell our parents in the community. I serve on a lot of committees in my community as well as during the state for presentations. And I bring staff along and we present what we do and share what we do so that everybody benefits. That's one of the things that we do. And then we put it everywhere so on our website, in our reports that we give, through our parent committees, our board of education. We recognize a lot of people on a monthly basis. But that's what, we're, that's what we're proud of is our student achievement. Thank you. Dr. Burns. Could you give some examples of the appropriate role as well as the potential opportunities of technology in enhancing student instruction? I'm sorry, can you start the question again? Could you give some examples of the okay. appropriate role and as well as the potential opportunities of <clears throat> technology in enhancing student instruction? Thank you. That's, a, that's an excellent question. That's one of the things I've been focusing the last four years about what technology can do for us, not only in learning but also for our work. And um, not only is what is technology, what can it do, how to use it, how to keep updated, um, how do you have professional development available. We use it for a lot of reasons for our own work every single day in terms of emails and website and 
distance, distance learning, teachers use it for grading, kids use it for multimedia projects and showing what they can do. Um, kids and teachers and administrators, I use it all the time just to look for resources and how to look for information, so to how to access information. Uh, we do a lot of, uh, through virtual high school is something we've done because we are, again, we're a small district, we want to meet the needs of all of our kids, so we have that available for our kids too. Um, and just uh, keeping up on it and uh, having a plan that's really an operating plan and finding the resources in our budget to make that happen. It's a piece, it's a tool like anything else. And uh, when we first started in some districts, they had a lot of technology but no skills for teachers and so it just sat there. So it was the educational process of putting it in their hands and showing them what they can do. Um, some of the things that we've done is that we've taken some of the teachers that are real comfortable with it and use them as mentor teachers to other teachers. And we use kids to teach teachers and other kids how to do that. So some of our, uh, we have one student right now that's interested in the technology field and so he is our co-op student that works with our tech director. Um, I think one of the things that's really helped us a lot is to teach our parents about what we do with technology in the schools every day because a lot of them don't have a clue why we need it, why do we need to keep updated, and what do we do with the old stuff once it gets outdated. So. Okay. Just let, as a follow-up that, how do you evaluate how effective technology is being used? How do you evaluate? Um, some of the ways we can do that um, is just, in fact, of how many times kids access the computer. There are lots of reports that can pull off from that. How many times as a teacher, as, as planning for instruction, uses technology as that tool, as maybe an instructional tool or even an evalu evaluation tool? Um, how many times people hit our website in terms of what they get off the website? Um, how many, just emailing, I mean, try to do a paperless office in terms of what things go across the board. We have, um, even, even to the point of putting our, uh, work requests on and seeing how many times that people are accessing and following up, just communicating back and forth. Um, in one district we had voicemail, like homework hotline types of things, so there's ways of knowing whether or not parents access those hotlines to get information off of that. Um, another district that I worked in, we did at the end of middle school, we had a performance. They picked a project and they did, they did all the research and then they, they actually, sh using a, some method of technology, shared it with a group of panelists to show what they could do. We wrote curriculum in Saginaw Township, right along with our curriculum for the core areas. So we were able to, teachers develop their monitoring tools, we knew that they were using the technology. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Dr. Burns, um, athletics and co-curricular activities are very important in our community mm -hmm. and to our students. Please share with us your philosophy and priorities on both. I think that I go back to the whole research on multiple intelligences and people learn different ways and um, they can learn a lot of things besides just the academic areas. They can learn to be a team player. They can work on skills being hands-on. I think that just makes a whole round rounded person to have the extracurricular and the academics or athletics. We, in our district now, we have what's called, we're the Lakeland Athletic Conference, although we have a really big fine arts festival where we take the top of our top of kids for every district school and we put every, every year, one, one school hosts that event, the top of the top, and we bring in experts from the community to actually present to the students and then they perform at night what they've learned. So that's a fine arts festival. We also have the, uh, Extracurricular, that's one of the measures for us in terms of how well our students are doing is how active they are participating in school and, and encouraging that co-curricular piece so they can actually show what they've learned every day in school. So if there's a way to keep it, I'm a believer in it because it works for some kids so it can meet the needs of all kids. What experiences have you had working with special needs students? Part of my background, if you looked at what I was trained in, I was that passionate at-risk kid. I was an at-risk child myself going through school. And if I wasn't to get to where I'm at today, it's because I put myself through and made it happen. So I, if you look at home economics, you look at food service, you look at child care, I had a lot of those at-risk kids. And my philosophy is they can do just as well as anybody else. And so where do they need the extra support? And special ed, um, even though I'm not special ed trained, it's part of my responsibilities for curriculum instruction. The special ed director 
work with me. And I guess my philosophy is let's intervene first through at-risk programs or um, staff advisory teams <coughs> or even the preschool brain development and early even infants and toddlers so that they are successful as they go through school. Intervene first before we put special on, special ed on and try to as much as possible. If you walked in my elementary schools and elementary principal, you wouldn't be able to tell which ones were special ed and which ones were general ed. We had three programs there and we did what I call modified inclusion. Most of the time they're in general ed, but there are times that they pulled out as well as the general ed kid who needed or struggled in that particular concept. So that's what happened. Is this in the district that you're in? That was in Lake Orion. In Lake Orion. Mm -hmm. Have you developed any alternative methods to delivering services to meet the needs of special ed students or been involved in that? <clears throat> um, like, are you talking about like alternative high schools or are you talking no, about? No, not, not as specific as that probably, but an alternative method would be um, maybe elaborate a little bit. You were talking about um, not pulling kids out, finding a way to uh, deliver services in that manner. We do. A, we had a lot of teacher assistant teams, um, like like uh, student assistance teams. Like if, if a teacher was struggling with a kid, we had that child brought forward. And we kind of brainstormed of, of different ways we can meet the needs of that student. Um, I have worked with Saginaw Township when we developed our middle school. We had the we had the teaming and the blocking, and so we had a special ed teacher assigned to a team, which they actually instead of working uh, turn teaching, they were actually working collaboratively together. I have worked with teachers when I was doing teacher education and curriculum development and doing stretch girls for kids that were more talented as well as adapting for instruction for the child that was struggling. What does they absolutely need to have before they leave this classroom? So I've done a, a lot of that uh, piece too. Um, we also, using some of our at-risk funds that we had in Saginaw Township, I was able to, what I had probably would call, change your name now, but we had homeschool liaisons. And they were social work type folks that worked between the families. So it wasn't the counselor, the counselor was there too, but it's another role, but the, that social worker type worked with that family and was a link between school and home. So that helped a lot with those at-risk kids. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Burns, <coughs> have you ever been in a situation in which your knowledge of the students' needs and your knowledge of the capabilities of the district uh, led to a unique and highly beneficial action for your students? One more time on your question. Yeah, that's a long question. Okay. I agree. <laughs> Have you ever been in a situation in which your knowledge of the students' needs and your knowledge of the capabilities of the district uh, led to a, a unique and highly benefil, beneficial action for the students? I think about when I think I, I think of a couple things that cross my mind. That's a good question. Um, some of the things that we have, um, and I go back to my career in tech ed, ed days with using the the community as a classroom rather than the school building. Mm -hmm. And one example that we had just recently was my life management teacher was very interested in culinary arts, and she built the program so big that she didn't have space. We didn't have space for all the kids that wanted to take culinary arts. Okay. So she was kind of beside herself. What am I going? What am I going to do? And so what we talked about is what do we need to have? What kinds? What kinds of things do your kids need to have that will benefit this program? It's a vocational program. How do they get interested in that? Sort of like work shadowing. And so what we did is we looked at what do the kids needs? Okay, the hotels and the restaurants. So through the Chamber of Commerce that I belong to, we were actually set up where kids. How many kids do you need to have in your classroom to be successful teaching? So whatever that number was, whatever the remainder group is, we actually rotated them through two restaurants and <coughs> a hotel in the area who actually took our students on. And we developed an action plan or a work plan with them, trained them, and they rotated back in. And we had other experiences. And they actually, throughout the year, developed that curriculum. So it benefited us. Sure. They knew a lot about our kids. And it benefited them because they were expanding the profession as well as they had the summer work that they needed when it came to summertime. So that's one example. Very good. The other example that I thought about is uh, um, we were running shortage of teachers when I was in, you know, we had Saginaw Valley right, right next door. And it was difficult to find teachers, especially uh, the minority teachers. So I volunteered to be the field teacher as well as the student te teacher supervisor. So basically I worked with the college dean and I said, give me the best of their best. We'll take them on as interns in our school district. And uh, 
and, and you can, instead of paying me, I gave it toward the substitute class so our teachers had professional development, and then I got to hire the best of the best, and they stayed in my district. So win-win for both of us. And that, I think, believe still happens today as, as we speak, which is great. Thank you. Dr. Burns, sort of as a follow-up to that, only it's regarding, more regarding your staff, can you give some, some examples of how you have impacted the knowledge and skills uh, and practices of your employees rather than of the students in your district uh, or with, if it's not the employees, the unit that you administer? I mean, I assume that would be your I staff. encourage that. I'm a believer of professional development. I kind of walk my talk, talk. and so I, I go along and, and do a lot of training. Um, we do a lot of board retreats together. Just if there's a topic we need more time on, we learn together. Um, some of the things I do as part of their evaluation, especially the, the administrative team, is we look at uh, technical skills to do their job, but I also I ask for stretch girls that they want to learn too, and I'm sort of the coach on the side. Um, and so they develop things, and I'm the, we meet on a regular basis and helps them to grow and stretch also. If, in fact, we go to professional development, we come back and we report. If I go to a professional development activity, I come back and report to you what I've learned that's going to benefit you folks as board members. Same thing with my administrative team. We work together. When they go out, they come back and share what they've learned. So that's a good thing. Um, in a prior district, as part of their uh, contract, when we negotiated, a lot of changes were happening with uh, MEEP tests and student achievement and No Child Left Behind, all those kinds of things. So as part of their contract, the teacher group had to give us six hours of professional development each year to, in order to meet the contractual guidelines. We actually wrote it in negotiations. And so my office actually did professional development based on what we were studying in curriculum for that particular year. And we had not only the new stuff, but also the ongoing implementation piece. And that really helped us get to where we needed to be, because we were kind of status quo, and we needed to grow and stretch. The other thing that's worked in some districts is we've done book clubs, where we've had an educational book, and we all read the book, and we sit down and discuss it, which all helps, and we share ideas on how to make that happen. We have also, when we first learned about technology, I wrote a grant to have, and this is years ago, um, is I, I think it was 20 computers, it happened to be Mac at the time. We were doing math, new curriculum coming into place, wrote a grant for 20 computers, gave, asked for a team of teachers that were willing to take a, take a risk. I'd give you a computer for the year. We developed uh, chat groups and we videotaped them doing instruction and they analyzed and talked about their strategies. And so they learned about math, they got to learn how to use the computer. The next year, they became the coaches to the next group of people until these Macs practically died. But it went around the district, and that was one of the other ways that we could help to. We also bring a lot of people in for training. We, have a, we really try to encourage the community and the schools, uh, people especially, especially in our small town, trying to have some of the graduates come back to be guest speakers in our classroom so kids can see what they've done once they've left our school district. That's been really helpful. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Burns, in your resume and also with your discussion here, you've referred to team building quite often. What is your strategy for team building and promotion with the board and yourself? One of the first things that I'd like to do when I, when I first came to the district and when I work with a group of people is to have a board retreat that we can talk about our standards of practice of how we want to work together and communicate together. And I, I do a couple activities. It might be belief statements about what do you believe education should be, what should the district offer. We kind of talk about what we believe in. So we're on a common page. And try to be as, as I'm very open and honest. And you know, it's one of those, you just tell me anything. I, you know, and we'll, we'll sit and talk about that. And we actually develop a standards of practice. And we all sign it. The administrators do the same. A lot of times when we work board retreats, we have our administrative team and our board team together, because we're in this together to, to do the school district. Um, and I try to encourage risk taking. You know, nothing's a crazy answer. We look at what we call now possibilities, and we talk about, is this a possibility? And it's just developing <coughs> relationships. It's bottom, bottom line is getting to know some, something about each one of you folks or each one of the staff members here, something about them, something personal about them, and know their name and what they do. That, to me, is one of my goals is to get to know folks, get out there in the buildings, get out there in the community, and start to make those connections. And that's how I've been successful with team building. And if something's not working, to be there to help pull them up to carry them forward. And I'm very honest, if something didn't work, I, you know, I messed up. We need to correct this, and we need to move on. And we've done that, too. So 
that's the kind of thing that we've done. I guess I don't really call it team building. We just kind of work together and not afraid to put the, the things on the table. We talk about strengths. We talk about limitations that we have. We talk about what if we had the opportunity to do that. Can we do it? And then we talk about things that we don't have control over. And we just kind of put those aside and deal with things that are possibilities. And we make the possibilities happen. And as we move on, there's every one of us has got strengths. And we can pull from those strengths and make things happen. And that's how I've been successful. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Burns, describe a situation in which you came, uh, you came with a proposal to your board or supervisor that you were very high on that was rejected. And then describe what you did in that situation and why. Hmm. I think it just happened recently for the last couple of weeks. We're, look, we're doing the budget process, Scott mentioned that. But uh, one of the things that we have is in our county, we have declining enrollment major. Kind of, we just don't have the babies born in our county. And, it's, and it's, we're right on, we're a tourist area. We have a lot of farmland and we have the village. A lot of folks come from Chicago and, and buy second homes with, and they don't have kids with them. So that's a declining enrollment plus the fact of birth rates aren't there. It's just one of those kind of, that's what's happening in that area. So we have seen, you know, as long with the, each one of, those, of the kids, of dollars. So one of the things that we were looking at is we have one of the largest area school districts in my, in my area. We have a school. We, had a, we actually have three communities that have consolidated called River Valley. And one of the buildings that we had is a very, very old, one of the, probably the, ones, the one building that needs the most work. And it houses all of our sixth grade students. And as administrative team, we were looking at, okay, we've done everything we can in terms of looking at every one of our budgets and all the areas that we thought we could cut back on or do a little better job. If, in fact, we closed this school building and moved those sixth graders into our elementaries, we didn't feel it would be a loss of program, but we could save the district about $200,000, okay? So we presented it to the board as a possibility. The options had went through the school improvement teams, got the teachers involved, and one of the things that we recommended is to have a forum so we can let the community know what our plans were. We brought it to the board, and the board you know, discussion seemed to be on the same page, and two weeks later, they decided not to close the building, okay? So, and part of me says, okay, where are we going to find that 200000 to keep this building run, you know, for running for next school year? But on the other hand, you know, we tried for that. It wasn't the right timing or the right decision for them. So even though you have to just kind of bite down and say, okay, the board is still in charge, <coughs> and they made that decision, I need to follow through and continue to cheerlead and look for other ways I could make that happen for them. So that's a disappointment for all of us because we were ready. We were ready, and I think the staff was ready. I think for the most part the community was ready, but the board was not ready. So that was an issue we had to think about. And I think we go back to that. I think the board constantly goes back and says, oh, we could have closed this building and that would have saved 200000 So the decision was there. We made it. We need, to mo we need to move on. So that's what we did. Thank you. Dr. Burns, the superintendent, as you know, is recognized leader of the school district. And as such, you uh, lead, you lead through the vision and the values of the district is imperative. Have you ever had a situation in which you had to redirect the activities of others so they were in accord with the district's vision and values? And what did you do? That's a good question. I had to think about that one. Um, Probably was probably my first year in my district, I, and I it, and I don't know if this is even close, but I mean I, I understand where you're coming from. It was a really it, the first year I came, we had some weak administrators, okay, and this was a really tough decision, and I worked with those folks and worked with them hard to determine whether or not it was skills not have, resources not have, training or how they got to their positions, but wasn't getting a lot of success from that, so we had to make a hard decision, not to renew some contracts, okay. And I kept the board up to date the whole time, so they understood. I think a lot of people understood, but it was something local. They've been there for a long time. Um, it needed to happen for the best interest, in my opinion, for the district and the kids there to not renew these contracts. So the whole thing about getting the best persons for the job, allowing them to do the job, moving us forward to, to have student achievement, having a safe and orderly environment for our kids, it was not happening with my current administration that I had at this building. 
So we now renew the contract. It was a really tough decision. Um, we made through, and we, the next tough thing I had to find was the next administration to take over for what left over and work through that with the community. And, and I have to say we've been successful. That was three years ago. It was a tough decision in the community, um, but we needed to do that in order to move on, and so we did. Does that answer your question? Good enough, yep. Okay. Dr. Burns, this question deals with uh, bond issues and the mm -hmm. building maintenance. And describe your experience in new construction, renovation, and building maintenance. <clears throat> oh, yes. When I worked for the State Department, there's a lot of school districts. That was back in the early, uh, early well, let me see, 86, 90. You know, 80s, 90s, when people started looking at their facilities, they were getting old and they do, needed a lot of renovations. So I was called in a lot of times to work with school, schools to help them plan for new programs. And I'm talking about the career tech ed area. That's most of the ones I dealt with then. So that was my experience. I saw a lot of schools, a lot of folks going through and just talking about current initiatives and curriculum instruction and what needed to happen helping them with advisory committees, their steering committees, those kinds of things. I moved there to Lake Orion, which is a, used to be a pretty suburb farm rural community, Oakland County, Northern Oakland County. Everybody moved out of Birmingham, Bloomfield Hills, up north. All of a sudden, we are booming kids. Like within three or four years, from 5,000 to 7,000, we were building schools <laughs> every day. And some of our buildings that were old schools, and I happened to be a principal at that point in time. So my experience was passing that millage working with staff on planning, if we're going to do this, here's our opportunity. We don't know when we're the next opportunity is going to go through. So the whole planning process that you do with staff, the whole planning process that you do with the community that my school represented, as well as the district on that planning team to talk about uh, what is best practices and how do we build schools to be flexible enough for the next 10 or 20 years, because that's what we're going to be doing. So I, I did all that, and we worked with the millage campaign. And then once we passed the millage, um, in terms of renovation, my building happened to be the oldest building, so that whole punch list and working with the architect and all those kinds of things I've had experience doing. Um, in my district now, we have not done anything like that. We're in the process now. I've got, I got, we were, we're looking at facilities because new, the school that I was talking about earlier, all those big dollar decisions are starting to make a difference. Do we put fiber down? Do we do wireless towers? Do we do this? Do we do that? We need to have a facilities plan. We've got what we need in terms of maintenance. But now we have to talk about three to five years down the road. So we have a big steering committee I am just doing as we speak, starting in a couple weeks, on kicking off to talk about what does our school district look like three to five years based on what we know demographically in the district. So that's one thing we have to do. I have not been a superintendent of actually passing a millage as a superintendent. I've been on support staff, administrative staff to do that. But again, if I don't know the answer, I'm good about going out and finding the answer to make it a decision or helping somebody make that decision. Okay. As you know, a superintendent must be an accomplished communicator. What do you think your strengths are in this area? That's one of my strengths. If you look at my the <laughs> communication, both oral and written, is my is one of my strength areas. Um, any way I can communicate, um, I spend a lot of time looking at key communicators in our area, key groups that I need to talk with about my school district, through staff, written things presentations, those kinds of things. That's one of my, what I do well. Thank you. As a superintendent, you often have to deal with parents. <laughs> and sometimes they're difficult parents. <laughs> um, have you ever had a valid complaint um, from a parent against a, a district or administrative uh, unit and, you know, or person? And how did you handle that? Um, pretty much as, as a superintendent or just a parent complaint in general? Either way. I got one today or so, like for example? Go okay. Go for it. Um, first of all, I, we try to establish as much as we can. I know there's people that just want to go to the top and get an answer now. But we try to do a, a chain of communication. So one of the things that I will do is I will respond back and just ask the parent what the issue is and who they talked to so far. Okay. And what, trying to figure out what the complaint is, what is the root of the complaint. Um, depending on how that goes, I will, well, let's back up. Before I even actually call back a parent, I probably will call whoever 
building that belongs to the principal, going back to that chain of communication again, you know, I just got a phone call from so and so, do you know anything about this? So it kind of prepares me what I'm going to get. Um, if the parent complaint is there, I will try to encourage them to go through the building principal down to the teacher if it happens to be the teacher. And I will encourage them that if in fact they're not satisfied or didn't, don't get a response back, and I say 24 hours, 48 the max, give me a call back. And then I respond back a couple days later to say how things, how things were. Um, there are times that the principal is frustrated and the parents frustrated, I will bring both of them in and I will talk to them and sit down and talk with them. But there's always some kind of face-to-face -face or, a, I'm not face-to-face, -face, but just some kind of communication on their issue. And if we get more than or similar issues, we talk about that in administrative council to talk about, okay, these have come up. Is this something that's happening to you? What are our solutions to help with this problem? So we try to, as much as we can, to listen, 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 and then try to uh, see what we can do to solve the problem. And there are some times, I had one case, because we had graduation last week, a parent was insistent that their child walk across the stage, but we have board policy that says they must meet all the graduation requirements, and they were not happy. And I listened to what they had to say, and we talked about, from the beginning of time, what needed to happen, and whether or not another key thing for me is documentation about who talked to who and what happened. And I said, you know what, my hands are tied. I have a board policy that says this, and I cannot do this for this reason. So sometimes I've had to be, do that too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Victor Burns, you alluded to earlier there regarding a facility plan, because apparently you have some, a building that's old. We okay. have all the buildings are old. Very old, yeah, okay. <laughs> would you, uh, which would involve strategic planning right. uh, of uh, uh, one scope of the, the uh, strategic plan. Could you describe the steps that develop a strategic plan, not just on facilities? Okay. But but we've had, well, for the facility plan, just to go back for that, we've, all of our buildings are very old. We've been dealing with a sinking fund for the last three years, and it's, it's almost to the end. So we have got to talk about other things. And so we've had a, a plan in place of what we're going to do each year. Um, and what we look at when we do a strategic plan for anything is what is and what do we need to be, like the goals, and then how do we get there? And then we put down persons responsible and, and um, timeline. Um, I have done a lot with that for school improvement with North Central accreditation. I've done a lot with that for just getting summary accredited for some of the buildings I've worked with myself of actually looking at data to tell us where we're at compared to others and where do we need to be and then looking at ways to get there. And then every year um, looking at those strategies to see if we want to keep that goal, continue on to something separate from that and we assign folks and we respond back and we report back to whoever were our stakeholders. But um, most of the strategic plans I've worked with has been school improvement plans and strategic plans for the district. And basically, folks like you, folks, the parents, the grandparents, the business owners, the represented along with the teachers, support staff, we sit down and we go through a process of what is and what do we need to be. And, um, and a lot of the stuff is based on research. What do we know out there? and how do we make it happen in this school district and how do we get there and what's reasonable time to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's what we've done. How do you ever assess or evaluate that? Then? We talk about that. It's part of the plan. It's okay, how do we know when we get there? Yeah. So we you, talk do about, in, you do that in the plan itself exactly. as far as yep. plan for the assessment? Right. So we have a goal and we talk about strategies and we talk about measurable outcomes. What do we expect from this and how do we know when we get there? Who's assigned and what's the logical time period to do that? and then report back about what we've done. Okay. Dr. Burns, you've mentioned that uh, you have built key relationships up with centers of influence within the community and groups. Mm -hmm. Could you give us some examples how those collaborative uh, mutual relationships have benefited the school and how you utilize them? One of the ones that really was surprising to me when I first came in this district that I work in. It's, again, I said it was three large communities and a lot of little lakeside communities. And I'm thinking, what group would interface with the group I work with? So I chose, we had lots of, we have lots of churches in our community. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different kinds of churches. So, and we also have a ministerial association. And I discovered that just talking to people because I, I enjoy getting out baseball games and basketball games and whatever events, just so I get to talk to people. And I understood there was this minister, I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, that's a large group of people and their families are like my families. So I invite them in and we sit down and we talk 
together about issues that we're thinking about, issues that they've heard with from their parish, and we problem solve together. And when I first came, I told them that I wanted to talk about my goals for our school district and what I've learned, and I wanted to bounce it off on some folks, and if they had a group of people that wanted to listen to me, I'd come in and do that. And two of the largest churches took me on, up on it. So I was able to go to their church service and meet with their folks. So I do, that's the key, and I still meet with those minister, ministers. There's a couple, I mean, they come about 10 or 12, and uh, we kind of host it at school, or they host me at their, their church or, or a restaurant or whatever, and we talk. So that's been really beneficial for some things, just the pulse of what's happening in the community. So that's one example. We also have a huge um, River Valley Senior Center, because again, a lot of people retire in our, in our area, and there's a lot of talent there unused that could help us do some of the things that we want to do. So um, I try as much as I can to get there at least a monthly, bi-monthly, just to interact with the senior citizens to find out what's happening. So playing bingo and eating lunch with them. <laughs> no, they, 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 have like, they have like 10 cards and they're all <laughs> and I get all mixed up. I'm thinking, okay, just give me one or two I can handle, but 10, they have all their little critters and things. So. But it's fun. I enjoy meeting them because then I can see them in other parts in the community. So that's really fun to do. So those are two examples. Um, the Rotary Club, uh, for me, I'm a Rotarian and pretty involved. And so that's really helpful for me because a lot of those folks are business folks. It's not just educators, but a lot of businesses from around the community. So that's my chance to talk about my school district and use them as volunteers and we share with each other. So that's another example of what I do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Burns, talk about what you do the first 100 days. And at the end of those 100 days, what would you like to have accomplished? Let's see, let's see, that's three and a half. Um, I think the first 100 days, I would probably want to be I, uh, focusing on meeting the people that I'm going to be working with. Okay, so I'd like to be able to meet every staff person, every staff person not just teaching staff, custodial staff, bus drivers, and try to get, to get to know them on a first name basis and something about them and what they do. That would be one of the things I would work on. I would probably ask the Board of Education to meet with me in a board retreat so we can talk about how we're gonna work together, how, would, how we're gonna to communicate together, um, some issues that, of setting, helping me set my goals that I'm gonna be working on that year. I think that I would probably work with you folks as well as the parent groups that you have in your community, because I know they're very involved here, is to find out who those key communicators are in the um, community so I can meet with them and talk with them and what they see are some of the needs in the community. Just listen. I guess, that's what I would probably do. And I probably, I read one year's worth of minutes from your website. I probably want to go back and just read your, get more details about your school improvement plan, what are you working on some of the things that you're working on so I'm familiar with what's happening in this district. I probably will meet with your superintendent that you're just leaving because he's been here for a long time and he's probably got a lot of knowledge base too, but just working on who I'm gonna be working with. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, this question allows you to talk a little bit about your accomplishments because we'd like to know what you've done to make your current district more effective and that's open-ended and you can approach that any way you want. Again, probably my district, and I, I came in my district, we had a lot of needs, um, basic needs on just being a quality district. And I think, and I'm being very honest here, it was pretty much status quo, not really knowing what could be um, oversight, accountability, efficiency. As I said, we had, I think we have, we have wonderful staff. I think I'm, I'm blessed with a wonderful staff. So that the curriculum instruction area, really, the principals did a wonderful job with some of those kinds of things. What I saw is just um, accountability with budget out of the finance office, accountability on, as I said, with some of the you know, personnel office of making sure all the records that were supposed to be there that needed to be there, putting together the process and procedures. Um, that needed a lot of work, okay, so that's what we, did. Everything needed to talk about just being more uh, documentation on things and having things just legally in the files that we didn't have done. Um, we had a lot of like board policies that were not followed. So just kind of bringing things to attention of folks as things came up, discovering that, bouncing it off people and putting those process procedures in place. Um, again, just key um, 
looking at key staff and looking at our whole team and what we needed to do to move forward and, and hiring really good teams. So I put together a wonderful administrative staff to work with, supervisors and administrators. And so I'm very proud of that. Um, just cleaning up safe, orderly environment, basic kinds of things that you would think would be in a district that was not there. Balancing a budget. Um, helping principals to understand site-based decision making and following budgets and accountability for things. Working with the Board of Education, I had a board that was micromanaging a lot. <laughs> a lot. They were not, they were a young board. They never had training on how to be a board member. So putting in orientation on what it's like to be a board member. Um, how to work as a team, as a full board, not a board member, but a board of education. Does that make sense? You guys are nodding up and down. I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, just having the administrators talk with the board members. Again, they were micro there was no leadership there, so that's what we had to do. And then working with the community to, to be able to invite them in our schools. My elementaries were wonderful. My middle high school had a closed door, and no, nobody knew, never walked in the door. They were just knew nothing would follow through and just like this open hole. So having that be invited to come back and documenting, responding to things that were concerns that kind of been brushed aside. So it was a, you know, that was my district that I'm working in now. You know, it, it, every district's different. Some districts have been doing just absolutely beautiful. They've been very good districts, but they want to be excellent. So we talk about what excellent means and how do we get there. So we've done that too. Does that answer your question? Well, this is our, fir our first attempt. We we went <coughs> through quite quickly, so we can take a, pa a pause here. You can catch your breath <laughs> and think about because what you have an opportunity now uh, to make a statement on your behalf to the board and ask, and then follow that up with any questions you like to uh, direct towards us. I kind of thought about that because I thought one of your questions was going to be, "Why did you apply for the school district?" I thought that was going to be one of your questions. <laughs> And I guess what I want to say to you folks is I will give you 150%. That's who I am, okay? What you see is what you get. And uh, I am looking to grow and stretch personally, also professionally. I mean, I am in a small district. I want to grow a little bit more. And I want to be picky about where I live. Um, this may be my last position before I choose, and that's a key word, to retire. I like Hazlitt schools. I watched Hazlitt schools for many years. I followed Jeremy, who was in, in Saginaw Township, for some of those folks who have been on the board for a long time. Um, I have worked with Hazlitt schools, not only sorority sisters of mine from college, but just the university and the College of Ed. My passion is teaching and working with early childhood. I love the fact that that's what you're spending a lot of your time. Even though you may not have dollars to make it all work, you're making that a priority in district. I like that. I like the idea that your staff, some of your teachers, a few of them I know, um, love to excel and try new things. I love the idea that you have support for your schools in terms of your bond issues that you're doing. I read about the developmental assets, and I'm thinking that's the same thing I've worked with. We just got our survey results not too long ago from the Search Institute. Is that where you've done that survey with developmental assets? I'd like it to be a community. I mean, you folks work as a community. It still con is considered a community. <coughs> I like the idea of, of when you plan and think it's a community issue. I, I enjoy that. Um, I like that the fact that you're next to um, MSU, because I'd love to be back to MSU again. It keeps me alive. Um, so you have the access to not only the community colleges, but also the university. Um, my background is both general ed and voc ed, if you look at my resume. So I have the mix there. I've taught at elementary, secondary, and also the university level, so I understand that. I like the professionalism that you have in your staff here, and your expect your high expectations that you have for your staff, and I guess I want to be part of that. So. I'm picky about where I go. I can stay as long as I want to in Berrien County, but I really like to grow and stretch. Used to live here, very familiar with the area, so I can still have those contacts. Some of the questions I have for you, I guess, is one of them is, besides finances, I'm going to go back to Scott's question, what are some issues that you have in your school district that you're struggling with that need some attention? Besides finances? Yeah. That's because I know that. That's a given. Hmm. Go ahead, Pam. I think one thing is that uh, both our superintendent and our financial director are leaving. And we have just last week hired a new financial director. In fact, tonight we just confirmed it. And I think that's a challenge that, that we will be dealing with as a board. 
is um, bring two of the fairly top administrative positions on board at the same time. And we have a uh, long-term school board member leaving this year. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's certainly some, some of the issues I see us as facing. I'm going to see a changing board. And it's going to be a changing board here that we haven't had to deal with mm -hmm. for quite a while as far as numbers of board members changing. But I think it's going to change a bit in the near future here. Um, so that forewarning any potential candidates. Well, one of the things you need to know is that everyone, there's a lot of expertise on this board because you've been together for a long time. And you need to feel comfortable with your superintendent so they're part of a team. And you need to trust, respect. That's a real key issue because as you move forward, we have hard decisions to be made. And I guess we need to be able to talk together, be able to share ideas, and respect each other. That's a, that's a key, key issue. Um, finance director, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, in terms of me, I'm going to be a little bit uh, ahead of myself, but I've been the finance director for last year. I, I chose to, as one of our restructuring in our central office, to eliminate that position. And we've had to all wear the hats. So understanding what that role is, that's one of the pluses I can bring to your district, is I have worn all those hats, big and small districts, and that's one of the things I can help you with and help that next person with. Although we're going to have to work together, too, just to talk about how we're going to work together. And I guess, I guess my philosophy is to hire the best person for the job and let them do it and be there, support them if they need help, he or she needs help. I think one of the other things the superintendent will face is the same thing that we faced the last few years is that we have a lot of staff beginning to retire. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had large turnover. I think it will probably continue um, yeah. as we all reach that magic age and, and teaching becomes, you know, is a stressful job. And after so many years, uh, people decide to retire. So there is a, there is a, a turnover that's occurring that um, makes it especially critical that we are hiring the best people. And we do have a lot of new people coming into the district, and I think we will continue to have to have new people coming in. So, mm -hmm. And some of those will be key people that will be retiring, that will have to be replaced. Mm -hmm. And uh, that will be critical for the, uh, the superintendent and the administrative team that's in place. So. Oh, go ahead. I think one of the things that may excite you uh, is we have went into a joint agreement with Michigan State University I saw that. Early Childhood Center. And getting that program up and running is going to be a wonderful experience for the community and the school district, but also a challenge in itself. So there's some teething issues that will come forward. There's teething issues with <laughs> children. Pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know the person that's uh, MSU, your, uh, Dr. June Yuna, I've worked with her on parenting ed from the State Department. She's worked with me before. It's been many years since I've seen her. She was pregnant for their first child the last time I saw her, so that tells you how many years it's been. So uh, familiar with that. So having her hand in that, well, I think it's her husband that's the principal of that building? Is yep. that? I think that's probably, you know, so there's a lot of potential there. Yeah. Brother-in-law. Brother-in-law. Oh, is it brother-in-law? And okay. He's here. Right there <laughs> Which one is it? This one. The okay. young one there in the front. Yes, the <laughs> young one. <laughs> so you're the principal of the building. Yes. Great. What a wonderful job. <laughs> Most days. <laughs> okay. Okay. I know June. I don't know Bob. So that tells you that I don't know you. <laughs> um, during Bob Regan's 14 years as superintendent here, uh -huh. the student population grew by about 30% in the last 14 years. Mm -hmm. But in the last couple of years, we've seen that level off and actually now start to decline. Yeah, I saw that, yeah. And so you know, when you have increasing number of students, you get increasing revenue, you're able to add programs, uh, you're able to do a lot of good things. Now, with declining revenues, uh, declining student population, that's a challenge. So you might have to, I guess my question to you, back to you, is how are you marketing your district to keep those kids here? Or are they just not here? Are they choosing to go elsewhere? Or what, what is we, attributing to that? What we've seen is that the, the housing, the, there is a lack of new housing being built in okay. Haslett. Uh, and people, because Haslett is such a nice community. Affordable. Affordable, affordable housing. <laughs> affordable I hear you. Housing, um, and Haslett is such a nice community to live in, people, have had their families 
grow up, but they're staying. Mm -hmm. uh, so their houses are not becoming available either. That's what I'm feeling right now in my district. I hear you. We are looking for ways of how do we keep our kids and look at what we have. And we have school of choice that we're, you know, attracting just to even talk about what our district has to offer all the time. And we look at not only our kids, but we look at the whole family. So we have that community ad is a big part of us that we need to develop a little bit more and use our schools as the focus in our community because we really don't have a, a town per se. So we work on our district and what we can offer. Well, I think Schools of Choice has helped us in recent years to maintain our enrollment. <coughs> um, Great. We don't take everybody, but uh, mm -hmm. we have enough people applying Great. to fill the Good. positions we have available. Okay. So I'm going to go back to a question I had, and I think Kristen had it one about if it was a year from now, a year later, right now, and I was your superintendent, what would you hope from me to tell you that I'm doing a good job for you? Settle the contracts. Settle the con which contracts? All oh, five of them. Oh, I thought you. Oh, I was reading your minutes. I thought you had some contracts. Was that well, just for you this said year? A year from now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now they all just one year contract. A year from now they all expire. No. They're in the middle of two years. Okay, gotcha. gotcha. So, yeah, that would be. Certainly be one. That would be a challenge. <laughs> okay. But not that we have any labor because we, to my knowledge, and maybe I've got my head in the sand, but we don't have any mm -hmm. labor disputes. But those are always interesting times, tenuous times, as far as we find things out that maybe we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. A year from now, I see that as clearly as, although you took finances off the table, I'm putting them back on the table. Uh, when I answer that question, that will be a, a challenge, not only for Hazlitt, but Everybody's uh, everywhere. Everybody's going through that. I mean, we're no different than anyone. Exactly. Well, we are different than some people. Our neighbors have problems different okay. than ours, but uh, okay. um, we don't have any major problems there, but that's always going to be an issue. Okay. I mean, contracts. Well, I was going to comment on the last one, but uh, the last for this, but this one fits in too. I, I think when, it, when you do well, it, it breeds higher expectations. And regardless of what swirls around in the state and the feds on standards and, and testing and all that, I mean, internally, we have just very high expectations. And I, I think the big challenge for all of us is going to be how we're going to get the MEEP and the, our scores as a reflection of who we are to the next level. We do well, but we've got room for improvement. How, and, and as you get that high, it gets really harder to make more improvements. Like on it for the AYP made. piece? But, but yeah. again, Charlie says it's PR. When those things come out in the paper, you want to stay up there or you want to show an improvement. And it's schools of choice related, whatever. And I think it gets, you know, we got a great staff and great administrators, but it gets, it's the challenge, it's harder. and so. How do we structure the incentives and how do we sustain that is going to be a challenge. And by the way, just so you know, June Hewitt is one of my bosses. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So, just, just to fill the circle. Out. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Anybody else? Anything. Any. I appreciate the opportunity coming this evening. Well, Dr. Burns, we really appreciate your interest in the district and Thank we've you. enjoyed having you here. And we're going to continue with our interviews. We have several more to go, and then we'll be able to contact you at the completion and tell you what, what, what will happen after that. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.